tonight, the down home Anne Murray. Funny, tough, opinionated. I will never be a babe. Behind the stage with Anne Murray. Good evening, I'm Gordon Vincent. Welcome to a special presentation of Life and Times. Tonight is the biography of one of Canada's premier artists, Anne Murray. Anne Murray's voice is so familiar, you may have danced to her songs at your wedding or hummed a few bars doing housework, but as familiar as she is, she actually guards her private life very closely, rarely putting it on display. And that's what makes tonight's program so unique. In this documentary, originally aired in the fall, we see the private side of the so very public performer. Wing the gate! Our microphone uh, at Dave Oak. How much time? If words won't do it, then words are just a waste of time. Anne Murray wants Just one more taste of life at the top of the right charts. To Not for the money. Her albums still sell a million a year. Surely not for the awards. She's won four Grammys and 25 me. Junos. She's been inducted into the Juno Hall of Fame. And even has her own star at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. But she hasn't had a major hit in more than a decade. So in 1996, Anne Murray is on the road again promoting a new album because she might not need another hit, but she sure would like one. There's always that little carrot dangling that your newest album you'd love to be a smash hit. And, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think that ever goes away. It's not like you ever get your fill of it. Tell me what would it take At 51, Anne Murray is a synthesis of the choices she's made in her life, balancing always between fame and family. Another early morning. 26 years of this is enough. She grew up in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, a small town best known for the Spring Hill mine disaster of 1958. 74 men died when a coal mine collapsed. In a town that stands so close to death, you learn to value life and neighbors and family, even when you're not a coal miner's daughter. Anne was born on June 20th, 1945. Her father, Carson Murray, a quiet, almost reclusive man, was a doctor. His wife, Marion, was educated too as a registered nurse, but her life's work was raising her family of five boys and one girl. Morna Ann Murray. Well, she was named after her grandmother, it's Morna Carson, and uh, I prayed to St. Anne. If I got a girl, I would call her Anne. Well, it's St. Andy Bo Pray that you, that you pray if you want favors. The answer to Mrs. Murray's prayers grew up in this house. Anne's father lived here until his death in 1980. Her 82-year-old mother, Marion, still lives here, surrounded by a lifetime of memories and just about as many pictures of her famous daughter. This one. My brothers call this house the shrine. Because everywhere they look, there are pictures of me. So she's tried in the last couple of years to include more pictures of the boys and their children. 
This place is a kind of monument to the Murray family. The children's rooms look untouched, but in fact, Mrs. Murray has done considerable redecorating, especially in Anne's room. My bedroom as it is now looks like my mother would have liked to have had it as I was growing up, but I wouldn't allow it. It's all frills and white things and petty point and all this. I mean, it doesn't look one bit like me. <laughs> Mom, from the time I was very little, t tried to dress me up and tried to put little ringlets in my hair. And then she would put little ribbons on the bottom of the braids, ever so cute. And I would rip those ribbons out. I hated ribbons and things, pretty, because I wanted to be a boy. I had three older brothers, and I wanted to play ball, and I wanted to play football and hockey and do all those things. I didn't want to be different from them. And then I got two younger brothers again, so there I was in the midst of all of this. She was a nuisance to them, you know, but when they wanted to pitch a ball or something and she was an extra, why well, they all accepted her. But I, I think they thought she was a pest at times. And uh, but so she gave, I think the boys gave her a hard time. Harold would never pass me without hitting me. He never passed me in his entire life until maybe I was 21 without whacking me right here or here or someplace. When Harold left for university, Stuart and Bruce and I stood on the back steps and applauded. We were never so happy in our lives to see anybody go. He, we hated Harold. Well, I'll tell you the true story of what went on <laughs> in our childhood. What? Even today, gathered round their old kitchen table in Spring Hill, it's clear that no matter how big the sister gets, Big Brother rules. Well, our father was a doctor and worked 80 hours a week and had no time for us. <laughs> and mother was overwhelmed with six kids and a bit of a social butterfly. Anyway. So you had to. So poor Ann was just left to drink. <laughs> No direction in her life. Her schoolwork was suffering. And finally, when she started drinking and smoking for a while, the three older brothers decided to step in. I never it may have seemed tough at the time, but now we call it tough love. <laughs> When I throw it, it's coming hard. <laughs> I'm very competitive. I grew up with five brothers, and I, I could never compete with them. I often think that perhaps the reason I became a successful singer was that I, I never could do anything as well as the boys. I wanted to do something better than they did. That something would be music, where she had talent and lots of encouragement. We had a phonograph that was upstairs, and, and we had all the, the records in there. Patti Page, we had Bing Crosby. I think I dreamed as a teenager. I can remember thinking to myself, I'd love to sing with Perry Como someday, because Dad and I used to watch the Perry Como show every week. And um, he, would, he would sit there and say, ah, that, was, that note was a little flat, that note was a little sharp, and pretty soon I could hear what he was talking about. At 15, Anne began training her voice. Once a week, she traveled 50 miles to a neighboring town to take singing lessons. Every Saturday morning, I got on a bus at 7 o'clock in the morning and came back at 8 o'clock at night. Whether it sprang from love of music or the Murray competitive drive, by now her dedication was showing. I used to um, lie on the floor with a huge encyclopedia, well, not an encyclopedia, it was a dictionary that weighed about 20 pounds, <laughs> and I used to put it on my diaphragm and practice breathing. I think it was grade 10, at her graduation, she sang Ave Maria, and she said she noticed people were crying in the audience, and that's when she first thought that her voice must be good. We had a group uh, when I was in high school, a group of three girls. I played the ukulele. We sat on stools, and uh, we had little straw hats and bare feet. We were called the Freshettes. After high school, Anne spent a year at a Catholic women's college. 
It was quite a leap from there to her next stop, living in residence at the University of New Brunswick. We first met Anne when she was hot off the girls' school, Catholic school um, press. It was uh, naive, it doesn't even cut it. She was, she was really pretty green. We taught her everything we knew. Jennifer Villard and Anne remain close friends. Thirty years ago, they were both studying phys ed and learning about life. Anne took a little worldliness from her friends and gave them back music. We used to um, sing in the rooms and we all found out very quickly that she had a great voice. Sing in the spring, sing in the fall, sing when I hear my baby ball. Sing Along Jubilee. In the mid-60s, this Halifax-based TV show is becoming a national hit. Anne's university roommates may have had more faith in her talent at this point than she did. They talked her into auditioning. We did have to talk her into it. She, I don't really think she would have gone with a, without all of our all of our prodding. Rambling around this dirty old town. Co-host and associate producer Bill Langstroth wouldn't choose her immediately. At the time, the show didn't need any more altos. Today, this man is her husband. The two of them remember that first audition. Well, I sat there on a stool and played the ukulele and sang, Oh Mary, don't you weep, don't you mourn, and just floored everybody. You were wonderful. As if. <laughs> we just adored you. Well, we, we were just sitting back, sitting there loving you, and we decided that it was too much happiness. Anne joined Bill as a regular on Sing Along Jubilee two years after that first audition. Her first contract promised a whopping $71.50 a show, 99 big ones if she had a solo. It was enough for her to give up her phys ed teaching job after just a year. But this would prove to be more than just a professional turning point. You know it's hard to love another man's girlfriend. You can't see her when you want to. You gotta see her when you can. The crooning between Bill and Ann wasn't just happening on stage. They were falling in love. But there was a problem. Bill was 15 years older and married with two children. This was all very clandestine for five years. I mean, a lot of people knew about it, but it was definitely kept under wraps. Um, we didn't just to keep the, the families, out. just to keep the families out of it, and and Bill's kids and all of that. Also, Anne's star was rising. To go public with their relationship could have tarnished the image of the pure, barefoot innocent that her fans had come to love. That image has stayed with her to this day. A fact that is somewhat puzzling to those who know her. I think the image that she had was the girl next door. Uh, but she became the girl bet next door by, in some of her TV specials, sitting in the Swansea Legion drinking a beer. I mean, that's not a, a milk toast image, really. She did all the things that you would not associate with a milk toast, and yet she still ended up looking squeaky clean. It's like being able to swear and not uh, sound like you're really being profane, you know? Uh, she seems to have that, that ability. As the Canadian editor of Billboard magazine, Larry LeBlanc has been following Anne's career since Snowbird days. The Canadian media went along with, you know, at the, at the same time, created this girl next door type image. That is not the image of anybody that I know who knows Anne Murray has ever thought about. Um, she's hard hitting, she's opinionated, uh, she's salty. 1970. The sweet singer from the Maritimes was about to rocket to the top. The 70s would be Anne's decade. This song, her signature. Snowbird was the first American gold record ever given to a Canadian. The snowbird sings a song he always sings. It made Anne an international star. Her career got a further boost when she became a regular on Glenn Campbell's TV show. How big spring? It's about 5,000. 55. Oh, you see. I really been around. <laughs> she and Campbell eventually became lifelong friends. But at the time, the leap to the big leagues was a little overwhelming. It was uh, kind of frightening in a way, although I had done a fair amount of television. I mean, I had already done four years of television 
It, I think it was more the idea of being in Hollywood. I was like very shy. I didn't approach anybody or anything. I just sort of stayed on my own and I was scared to death. This wasn't the only pressure Anne was facing. Her sudden rise to fame meant touring, being on the road for months on end with a band that was unruly and often unreliable. I lived on the edge all the time. I can remember doing flights and most of our flights, uh, we'd have stopovers in Chicago. And of course, there were bars in Chicago airport. And I would never know if we had too long a layover, I'd never know who was gonna be sober by the time we got, and I had once had somebody who fell off a stage, one of the players fell off a stage um, because he was too drunk to stand up. <coughs> Superstardom also brought with it constant probing by journalists looking for a fresh angle. The star wouldn't talk about the guy waiting for her at home. So when the media took note of Anne Strong lesbian following, people jumped to conclusions. Because her image was being painted in such a Pollyannish way, that was something that people hung on to because it was the only thing that, you know, that was real. You know, was, I, mean, I mean, she made Julie Andrews look evil in those days. I mean, she was, I mean, I mean in, in terms of the image that they were you know, portraying of her. So maybe it was something that people went, oh, well, you know, maybe she's gay. I was unmarried, I was a phys editor, a jock, and I had this deep voice and short hair. And um, I guess people thought I was unattached. Because, but of course, I was having a clandestine relationship with Bill. The road, the rumors, and relentless fame started to get her down. She was burning out. I didn't have any breakfast. I was all over the place. I tired myself right out. But I, I kind of woke up after that because I went, wait a second, you're killing yourself. And uh, after that first year, I think it would be 71, 72 in there somewhere, I kind of went, whoa, let's pull this together here. To take charge of her life, oh she needed help. <laughs> so she found herself a kind of professional big brother. <laughs> By this time, Anne Murray was a big star. She had the power to pick any manager. She chose Leonard Rambo, who at the time had a secure job with the federal government. She'd been impressed with his organizational skills a few years earlier when he booked her to sing at a youth concert. While Leonard had no experience managing a star like Anne Murray, he had a qualification that was more important. A fellow Maritimer, he and Anne shared the same basic philosophy, that what was most important in life is family and friends. It was an easy fit. For 25 years, until his death in 1995, Leonard Rambo was Anne Murray's manager, mentor, and friend. He made a lot of decisions on my behalf uh, without m my even... Be because we knew each other so well, I trusted him implicitly to make those decisions. And I handed it over to him. I said, no, if you need to talk to me, call me. But if you can make the decision, you do it. And he would, and anything of importance he would call. Um, it was just a a great relationship. We used to end, finish each other's sentences. Even though we ain't got money, I'm so in love with you, honey. Together, Anne and her new manager learned the business. She won her first Grammy for Danny's song, and the kudos just kept coming. She was told that Elvis Presley considered her his favorite singer. And another rock legend, one of her idols, paid her one of the industry's highest compliments. I was doing the Grammy Awards and uh, there was a knock on my door and it was John Lennon. And he made a special point to come to my dressing room to tell me that my version of You Won't See Me was the best cover of a Beatles song that he'd ever heard. I almost fainted. I was so thrilled by that because I, as far as I was concerned, the Beatles were the second coming. I don't know why you Want to hide. It would have been easy for Anne to have been seduced by the glamour of showbiz. But even at 25, it was clear that wasn't going to happen. I never ever told anybody I wanted to be a big star. It just seems to be happening. 
And lots of people can say, well, I'll go to Los Angeles, I'll live there, I'll be very happy, but I'm not happy here. So why give up that? I, I, I don't think that, that anything is worth that. My career is not my life. Uh, my life is to be around the people whom I love and uh, like to be with, and they aren't here in Los Angeles. I cried a tear. Fame and family collide when Life and Times returns. On June 20th, 1975, her 30th birthday, Anne Murray married the finally divorced Bill Langstroth in their home in Toronto. <laughs> I mean, ho, ho. The wedding was a cartoon. <laughs> uh, we had it in, our ho in my house. Well, it was supposed to be a secret, and we were asked to go up. And I said to Carson, there's something going on. I, I don't know what it is, but, but I think we had an idea. I had been in the studio, and I had arrived late. The priest was waiting. The priest was there with his dog outside. They were waiting for me, and my mother says to me, oh, this is at 8 o'clock at night, what are you going to wear? And I said, well, I don't know. Go up and pick something. Well, you know, she had this moo as I think they're called moo-moos, and it was green. You're going to wear that? She said, well, I often wondered what I'd do with it. Now I think I'll put it on. And that's Anne. But I can remember her father, a picture of her father, taking her into the room. You just think he was taking her to slaughter because he was so amazed at what was happening. We gave Dad a shotgun. And well, Mama said it had a ribbon on it. It did have it a ribbon. It was painted on white, it. a white shotgun. And uh, <laughs> poor Mum was having a fit because I was not taking this seriously enough, and I was late for my own wedding. And Dad, with the shotgun, Carson, put that away. <laughs> put that away right now. <laughs> and Bill was asleep by eleven. I was out of it by eleven. Yeah, he had a little too much wine. Little so he was. Dear. Oh, oh, sorry. Was it excitement? I, I, I didn't sleep a wink the night before. Yeah, I know, I know. And uh, so he was asleep. My mother's going. He's asleep. <laughs> How can he be asleep? This is his wedding night, for heaven's sake. I said, Mom, he's been married before. Never mind. <laughs> well, that was our wedding day. During the next few years, Anne focused on home, not Hollywood. Just a year after her marriage, she had a son, and then a daughter three years later. During this time, Ann and Bill made an occasional TV special, and she released a record or two. But professionally, it was an awkward time. And I really think that I thought at that time that I would uh, throw in the towel. But easier said than done. I was also in the red. I had no money. I was playing all these places. I was having a hit record here, a hit record there, but uh, there was no momentum. And um, so I had to continue working. But once I had William, I sort of felt like I could do anything. And I think a lot of women, women will tell you that, that once you have a baby, you feel, God, I can do that. I can. If I can do that, the rest of it's easy. Later, she'd call it a period of semi-retirement. She was certainly regrouping. Between pregnancies, she delivered her biggest hit. I cried a tear. I was confused. You cleared my mind. You Needed Me is Anne Murray's favorite song. It won her a second Grammy. She beat out Carly Simon, Olivia Newton-John, Donna Summers, and even Barbara Streisand for Best Pop Vocalist. She was on top of the world. Yet this world was in constant conflict with the other one, home and kids. The mix of fame and family was an uneasy one. Her children were never far from her mind. She even began playing long engagements in Las Vegas so she could have her family with her. I tried to make it as normal for them as possible, but my life is not normal. Um, but when they were old enough to go to school, um, I decided that they were going to stay home, and that was that. So Bill stayed at home with them. And had he not done that, I wouldn't have been able to do it. We decided that there had to be a constant in their lives. And 
I, I, that's the way it had to be, and I had the career that was uh, flourishing, so um, boom. That's mm. the decision was made there. Nineteen ninety six on the road with Anne Murray. Some things don't change. Anne still won't be away from home for more than two weeks at a time, and she ferociously protects her family's privacy. Few people outside the family would even recognize her kids. In fact, the young woman mouthing the words to one of Anne's latest songs is her 17-year-old daughter, Dawn. Raised away from fame's often ugly glare, Anne's children appear to be normal, happy human beings. These decisions may have cost the star, but they've sure paid off for the mom. Her work is one thing, and being a mom is the other. Like, she could be Anne Murray, and she could be just this mom that dresses in, like, sweatpants and, you know, hangs around us and does things with us, and, you know, but I, I would say that she's, like, kind of like two different people. I don't remember this, but I was told uh, at one point that um, I, I picked up the phone at our house and I said hello and it was my mom on the other end she said do you know who this is and I said yeah it's Ann Murray uh, it was it's sort of confusing because uh, I think at that age I I knew um, not necessarily the difference between the two personalities but I knew that she had a face that she put on and there was a real face so I guess in, in a sense yeah I had I had a, a keen awareness of that as a child he didn't understand why I was always leaving him, why his mother would have to leave him all the time. And I said to him, well, you don't realize how guilty I felt at having left you all those times and how difficult it was for me to do that. But it was either that or I, I did, had, to, had, to do something, had to do something else. You either do it or you don't. And there's only one way to do it. You can't do it from home. I realize now that it was really hard for her was it leaving hard for us. You? Yeah, it was. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say, oh, no, it was fine. But it was, it was hard. Like, you have to get used to that sort of thing. I mean, but you do. You just get used to it. I think I've gotten uh, a pretty damn good deal, actually. I mean, I, I look at anyone who has a different life and I mean it doesn't matter my parents are still together they love me and and there there aren't I mean we don't even have many problems in my family if if there's a problem you know someone just uh, complains about it and then it's out in the open and it's gone I think my mom and I have a really close relationship you can love your mom but I guess you could also like her as a person as well so, yeah, I, I love her and I like her, you know. Today on the road, Anne has her daughter at her side. And if it weren't Dawn, it would be someone else close to her. During the years, Anne has always liked to have somebody with her to counter her tendency to isolate herself. For five years, it was her backup singer and brother, Bruce. Well, I think she, she had become inclusive. So she had a tendency to go from the venue to her room, and that was it. And that's the kind of life she led. Um, I don't know whether she was really afraid of people. I think it was just uh, um, she didn't feel particularly safe because there were a lot of people around. And when I came on the road, I said, well, there's no reason why I have to stay in your room all day. I mean, if we're, if we're in Sydney, Australia, or we're in Melbourne, or in London, England, I mean, you don't want to stay in the hotel. So I, we get in a car and we go. Anne is a naturally private person, and that side of her personality has had some powerful reinforcement. She has spent decades looking over her shoulder. From the early 70s, she has been stalked by Charles Keeling, a Saskatchewan farmer obsessed with a songbird. They've never met, but Keeling believes Anne Murray is in love with him, even singing to him. He continues to harass her, in spite of jail sentences, psychiatric treatment, and numerous restraining orders. Anne Murray's changing image when Life and Times returns. Time don't run out on me. Yeah. 
Just finish it right there. The In 1996, Ann Murray's one strong woman. She's very much in charge of her life and her music. She has just got this kind of uh, sixth sense, I guess. Uh, you know, when I come uh, to the, sh the show prepared with charts and whatnot, she has this ability to see past that, you know, hear background harmonies, uh, uh, voicings on instruments, you know, if that, something's not quite right, she'll bring it to my attention as, and it gets changed right away and she's very aware of what's going on around her musically. It's quite remarkable. When it comes to her music, Anne is a perfectionist which explains why, for 10 years, she refused to take part in the Juno Awards. There was one shot taken of me singing You Won't See Me in 1975 at the Junos. And at the end of it, I go, hey! hey! What I was doing was reacting to an audience of people who were so apathetic. Half of them were drunk, and the other half were like, who cares? And uh, I was, a, I mean, I, I, just, I felt like crap on stage, and I thought, what kind of a music business is this that I'm part of? She told them she wouldn't be back until they turned the Junos into a good television show. They did, and in 1985, she was back. I was very nervous, because after having been away for 10 years or something or more, um, what was I going to say? And I thought of it. Just as I was leaving my dressing room, I just walked out and looked around and said, uh, So this is where you hold this thing every year. Showing up at the Junos after such a long absence caused a stir, and so did her new look. This really makes me laugh when people talk about my spiked hair. I mean, that caused such a furor. I got more letters from people. Well, you look like you just stuck your finger in a socket. All I had to do was take a bottle of spritz. The spikes were gone. In three seconds or less, the spikes are gone. Okay, now is this better? I don't have spikes? What the hell is that? I, I, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, you need to change. You need to change the way you look from time to time. And I will never have long hair. Poor Leonard went to his deathbed begging me to have long hair. He wanted a babe <laughs> up there on stage. I will never be a babe. I might sing great and, uh, and have fun on stage and entertain people, but I will never be a babe. And I'm going to, if I am a babe, I'm a babe with short hair. Give a jock like Anne the choice between an afternoon at the hairdressers or the golf course, and you know where you'll find her. She generally scores in the high 80s, and any golfer knows you don't do that without working at it. I don't think of myself as driven, unless it may be to play golf. I think I am sort of driven, I, and I think that there will be people who would attest to that, that I'm driven, or maybe obsessed is a better word. She's miserable on the golf course. I mean, it's not really fun to play with her on the golf course because she's a perfectionist. And, and if you're a perfectionist, golf is not the game to play. Oh, yes. That's more like it. Tried too hard. Damn. She pisses and moans all the time. From the first tee off to the very end, she pisses right and moans, right. and even my kids say they hate to play with her because she's a perfectionist. She's just never going to shoot in the 70s. I mean, she might as well face it now. <laughs> One of the women brave enough to go 18 holes with Anne Murray is her best friend, Cynthia McReynolds. Since they met almost 20 years ago, Cynthia's become like the big sister Anne never had. And really didn't have a life of her own. She certainly had her family and she had a career, but she never had time to kind of hang out and do things that she wanted to do. So over the years, I've introduced her to some of my friends. Oh, nice hit, Kay. She's very, very uh, forthright. Certainly there's no 
messing around with her. And she's like that uh, in her house. And she's like that on stage. She's like that on the golf course. She's exactly like what you see is exactly what she's like. Just who Anne Murray is continues to fascinate her fans. Every year, 20,000 of them tour the Anne Murray Center in Spring Hill. The center opened in 1989. The town wanted to celebrate its most famous daughter and boost the local economy. It was one of those things where they wanted to take advantage of my celebrity in one way and I was able to give them something back uh, because times have been tough for Spring Hill since the mines closed. So we were just looking for some way in which to use my celebrity to perhaps attract tourists. And then we have Anne's mother, Marion. Marion's a retired registered nurse. Anne refuses and to call it a museum, but how many people have a building in their hometown filled with everything from baby clothes to ball gloves, report cards to prom dresses? There are hundreds of pictures of Anne here with pretty much every famous person who's ever walked through her life. And of course, there are awards and gold and platinum records by the caseload. The public continued to dance with Anne Murray through the early 80s. She had two more hits, two more Grammys, but as the decade continued, her career stalled. I don't know what it was, but for some reason in the 80s in particular, her career, uh, recording-wise, went into a long, long, long creative slide. No one knows better than Anne Murray that in the music business, there are ups and downs. With this in That's mind, like. she has been smart enough to plan financially for the future. On the top floor of a high-rise building in North York, you'll find Balmer Entertainment. It's a multi-million dollar business that Anne has been quietly building since the early 70s. The company name, Balmer, represents Anne's longest standing professional partnerships. B for her husband Bill, A for Anne, L for Leonard Rambo, and Murr for Murray. I think I have a certain amount of business acumen, but I wouldn't say that it's a really strong point of mine. Probably my best attribute is listening to people. I have a lot of people around me in whom I have a lot of trust and respect, and I listen to them. The company has tentacles everywhere in the entertainment world. We're getting into uh, animation and uh, different, different television series. We've got property rights to uh, some movies. And uh, these are all things that are, we build on for the long haul. Three and a half years ago, Balmer opened a publishing and songwriting arm in Nashville. Look who's aching, whose heart is breaking this time. The company employs 10 house songwriters whose compositions Balmer pitches to other artists to record. Tom Long is the creative director of the Nashville office. What we're trying to do is create uh, a catalog of songs and copyrights that, uh, that Ann Murray will own, her company will own, and then hopefully will be explored around the world and will create a lot of revenue as well as uh, something that she can be proud of and we can be proud of. Maybe, I think we did originally it originally. Yeah. Okay. Of the songs written for Balmer or sent to her company, yeah, Anne will personally listen to about 500 a year. She's never written her own tunes, but always taken pride in her ability to pick the good ones. So when Anne chooses to record a writer's song, it's a very sweet feeling. It, it, it is such an amazing experience to sit there and, and watch someone perform who you've admired for years and years and years, like all my life, and hear these songs that I remember hearing, and all of a sudden, my song is up there too. She's singing my song. And it, it, it's, it's such an honor. I mean, it like, made me cry and laugh all at the same time. On the road again when life and times returns. When there's trouble passes. 
is over. In the mid-1990s, Anne Murray was ready for a new creative challenge. She had just started to gear up for a new album, when life temporarily knocked the music right out of her. In April 1995, Leonard Rambo, her friend and manager of 25 years, died. It's been a tough time the last couple of years. It hasn't been easy. I mean, first of all, watching him go and then trying to pull myself up by the bootstraps. And this was the album that was going to revitalize the career to a certain extent. Certainly not the way things were before or anything like that, but get things moving again. It never occurred to me that I would ever do anything without him. So I really had to regroup and, and pull myself together. And Anne was faced with the toughest professional decision of her life. Would she leave the stage forever or rebuild? She decided to go for it one more time. I need to talk to you about Adams, like for an hour, I need to talk about Adams. It's not going to happen today. Why not? Because I'm going to be home by six. Well, it's ten after four. Her new manager is Bruce Allen, a man with the reputation of a pit bull. At this point in her career, Anne knew that's exactly what she needed. I know how to go into a studio and do an album, but uh, I can't go out on the street and flog it. So I needed somebody with some experience. So Adam uh, is a golden boy down there, Anne, and he's done a hell of a job, believe me. <laughs> no, Bruce Allen is best known as the manager of rock star Brian Adams. It was because of the Adams connection that the new partnership with Anne was formed. Adams had co-written the song, What Would It Take? for Anne's new album. She called to see if he would consider singing back up on it. Sure enough, I asked him. He said, it'd be great. He thought this was a big deal. Things evolved from there. One day she phoned me up and asked if I'd be interested in looking after her. And uh, I talked to Brian about it, and Brian really wanted me to do it. He thought this would be fantastic. Because even when he finished the song, recording, he came back to the hotel room and he said, this is unbelievable, he said, recording with Anne Murray. Like, it was important to him, and it was a big moment in his life because he really respects her as a singer and as an artist. And of course, when I said, you know, she's asked if I would be interested maybe in, in looking after her, he says, you've got to do it. You have to do it. Because if Anne Murray calls, it's something like Queen Elizabeth calls, like, you got to show up, you know? Yeah, it's just too much golf. I've, I've oh, talked... Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> One game of golf I had this whole trip. <laughs> now, the other thing... Um, I said, Anne, the tour... You know, let's, yeah. let's be honest, you haven't been on the radio for a long time, you're going to need somebody to go in there and really kick some ass and get you back on the radio and get the, give this thing a shot you, because it's, you just can't throw records out there anymore and hope that they're going to get, get played. And Murray has come home. For the first time in years, and perhaps more than ever before, Anne is putting herself out there in front of the public and the press. So we have to create these events, whether they're in stores, whether they're TV appearances on morning television, whether they're interviews on radio, whatever it is, whether we have to say, we, she didn't do interviews in, in Canada much anymore, we've done that now. If you the strategy appears to be play. working. For the first time in 10 years, Anne Murray is back on the charts. But she's realistic about how tough the competition is. Uh, people want to see new faces, new young faces, that's what's happening everywhere. And eventually that's going to, I don't have any illusions about this. She's competing with Celine Dion, she's competing with Whitney Houston, she's competing with uh, Gloria Estevan, I mean we can go on and on Mara Carey, and she's got the vocal skills to take all of them on, however, it's whether or not she has the hungryness uh, to, to do it, the heart to do it. I'm as keen for this to be as much a success as anything I've ever had, and uh, I'm working my butt off to try and make that happen. It's a simpler, more real Anne Murray that her new manager is betting the 90s public wants to hear and see. Her new stage show will very likely be stripped down to the essential Anne Murray pure voice. She's put out a record that is appealing to a younger demographic. Now we have to take that show and catch up to the record. You'll see a totally different Anne Murray show than you've ever seen before. Because this girl is about music. That's what people don't understand. She's not about pretty dresses. She's not about Vegas. She's not about that kind of stuff. She is a real singer's singer and I think we have to put her in that environment so people can get it because they've forgotten it. But my dreams were slowly fading as time went quickly by. 
she has come full circle, back to the simplicity of song. Anne Murray has never been, will never be, one of those people who sacrifice who they are for what they do. She's no showgirl, no fame junkie, no prima donna. Just a singer with an extraordinary voice and a need to be heard. Going for it one more time. Could I have this for the rest of my life? Thank you very much. Just because people get older doesn't mean they don't want to continue to succeed and continue to co contribute in some way. Uh, this is the way I know best. Um, this is what I've been doing all my life and, I, I, and I, I do it well. So there's no reason why I shouldn't continue doing it until people just go, and shut up. <laughs>